this meeting is recorded and may and may be <laughs> uploaded Sorry. to YouTube at a later date. <laughs> That's okay. Recording it. I warned them, and now we're recording. <laughs> um, my name is Kelly Scott Reed. For those of you who are unfamiliar with me, I am the assistant editor in chief of Rafanyal Press and the host of a word, uh, Rafanyal's YouTube uh, channel, where I interview creatives, writers, poets and those who make the magic that makes this life worth living. Alison Tung is one of those people, a Singaporean poet and project manager, and frankly, an important voice in poetry. Alison's poetry has been published, well, she's had six poems published, <laughs> works published with Ruff and Yacht, and her work can also be found in Amley, I can't pronounce that, Heavy Feather Review, uh, Seas, Cows, and Elsewhere, and has been nominated for the Best of the Net Best Microfiction, and Best Small Fictions. Uh, released on February 13th by Kith Books, Reacquaint is Allison's debut poetry chapbook. Through 28 narrative poems, Reacquaint explores embodiment and chronic illness, burgeoning adulthood, love, and loss. Allison will now read from the book some poetry she has selected for you. After the reading, I will be asking some questions along the lines of a word format, so it's pretty casual. And then we will address some questions, maybe later submitted by some of you. And there will also be a guest reading by poets Francis Klein and Letitia <laughs> Jiju. And we will close off with one more set by Allison. I will drop uh, purchase and contact li links into the chat after we begin. And please mute your audio, everyone, and feel free to unmute for applause. Feedback can also be put in the chat. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy some beautiful poetry. Allison, take it away. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you all for being here to celebrate with me. Um, I'm actually pretty nervous. I, I don't know if it comes off, but I, I yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Um, so I'm going to be reading a couple of poems from my uh, new book, Rear Queen. I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, and I've got it all tagged in like, and color coded according to the book. Um, so okay. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read is called. Chronic is a word felt, not spelt. And it goes like this. Nobody should have a favorite seat in the A and E, a favorite spot on their arm for drawing blood. I once asked my doctor how long I would be following up with his clinic. He said lifelong, and I wondered if he meant his life or mine. In only 65% of my fantasies, am I absurdly attractive. In all 100% of my fantasies, I am completely recovered. Sometimes I get so tired I feel the beginnings of a poem slide off the sides of my brain and fall out of my mouth in a disappointing non sequitur. On particularly clumsy days, I can hear my pregnant saloon whisper from the ground, what if you just stopped? What if you just stopped taking all your medications? When people describe something else, something as something else on steroids, I laugh. I am me on steroids. Near a hospital at night, I crave a ham sandwich. I pretend I don't know why, but I do. The next poem that I'm going to read is, sorry, just trying to find it. One called Swimming is Allegory for Living. Um, and it's one that was uh, published by uh, RF as well. So um, very special to me. Um, so this one goes, when I say I don't know how to swim, I mean I never learned to do it properly. That they tried to teach me, but gave up when I couldn't figure how to turn my head just enough to breathe, yet not sink. I mean I can do some half ass version of the front crawl in which my face stays submerged for as long as I can hold my breath, while my arms slice through water in unintended tandem, and my feet paddle relentlessly like a runner ducks, propelling my body forward in small bursts until it feels like my lungs will explode if I don't allow my head to break through the surface that very instant to take in as much air as I possibly can, even if the lost momentum causes me to sink like a stone. When I say I don't know how to swim, I mean I never learned to do it painlessly. Another prose poem, um, this one is it has a really long title. It's called, which of course makes me a hypocrite for only falling in love with people I'm bothered by quoting texts. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it goes, 
As a child buying new clothes, I had to be told repeatedly to note just the fit and material when asked if I was comfortable. Because otherwise, and even really then, I'd jump to no, I don't want it. Because XL 100% polyester was digging into my back and the security tag into my side. And no amount of exasperated assurances that they can and will be removed would be enough for me. But the truth was that I just didn't trust my judgment. Because what if the dress still sucked? even without the tax. Then I never hear the end of how it was a complete waste of time and money, and nobody needs that. So it just seemed easier to fixate on the ephemeral scratchiness and say no altogether. I mean, for God's sake, I was six, and forty-four ninety-five could probably buy a house. And I mean, for God's sake, I am 30. And what if I looked past the surface irritants and took a leap, and it turned out to be a complete waste of time, honey? I'm not 30, I'm 32. It took like two years for this to be part of the book. Um, so the next poem is called Yarn. It's one of my favorites as well as a one sentence poem. Um, I tend to like to read those that have a lot of pork behind them. Um, so Yarn goes like this. Anyway, I was a skein of forest green yarn, cast on with intent to knit a scarf, or perhaps a pair of gloves, but which exactly no longer mattered. For at some point mid-pattern, it became obvious that I was on the wrong track. And so I unraveled to a loose strand that left untended tangled. Hence the hap has a temporary looping around of what remained of me. And until the next project came along, I said probable, knowing that someday soon, in spite of knitter or needles with drop stitches or perfect cables, I would be. So this was um, written during a time that I was really, really into knitting. I don't knit anymore, it hurts my wrist. But um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was an interesting time in my life because Singapore is a tropical country and um, there's no need for knitted stuff, like, ever. But yeah, um, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> Next one, another really long uh, title, Self-Portrait as Bottled Sand Art made in a mall, st mall craft store in the early 2000s. Glass bottles shaped like house cats, but anthropomorphized. Of thousands manufactured, but alone in its vicinity. Fogging where heat of palm collides with the stale cool, stale cool of mall central air conditioning. Manufacturing anomaly masquerading as design. Potential embodied awaits life as a calico or tabby. But nary four in the afternoon, and all sense feline associated or otherwise already run low. Yet resolve to exist reigns. And so blue, so green, so yellow, purple, pink, orange, red. Until a cat is a cat is a cat, made enough from unrealistic and odd and not enough. So um, when I was a kid, I would, you know, go out to the mall with my mother and um we would do sand art. So there was like the sticker type and then there was like the bottom type. And I remember this particular day where we went there and um, there were pretty much none of the sands left. We, we had like all the odd colors, but you know, um, the kind of colors that are associated with uh, cats uh, just kind of ran out. And it was pretty early in the day. Um, and yeah, that, that's where this comes from. This one is called Amalgam. To make room for this seedling of self to flourish, I fell an entire forest of me. Once dense woods now desolate, down saplings, trees, and snacks awash in sunlight unfiltered. Shuddering from equal parts acceleration and cold, certain I am unencumbered at last by every iteration of me that came before. But I have forgotten that remnants stem always from destruction, and at my roots lie my timbered remains, dampening, decomposing, disintegrating, until fragments return to feed and fat, the very earth from which I draw life. So I grow, but not anew. As some amalgam of the worst and best of every me, I live on, yearning to the heavens and receding into the land. The next poem is called Bicycle. Um, inspired by the time that someone tried to teach me to ride a bicycle and then failed really badly. Um, Anyways, um, exactly when did I get so wary, so overly vigilant, I catastrophized seven different ways before attempting anything even slightly risky. She must at least be in hibernation, 
that incarnation of me who at 10 decided the best way to learn how to ride a bicycle was to take off from the top of a hill with nothing but momentum on my side, throwing all caution to the classmate who had offered to hold my bicycle upright, but whose generosity was ultimately no match for my heft. I sure had life all figured out then, certain that triumph lived in eliminating all options but succeed and die trying. Two lifetimes later, I still recall with absolute clarity the acceleration that coursed through my entire body as my thick brown hair whipped back from my swifty face. The way the wind swallowed my well-meaning classmates' words of assurance or maybe admonishment. And how my sunflower yellow bicycle flipped right over at the bottom of the hill, sending me crashing to the ground. But only because I had slammed too hard on the brakes to stem the velocity I had gained too quickly, and certainly not before I learned to how to maneuver the two-wheel menace to ride a bicycle. As I washed a massive oozing scrape on my right knee with murky seawater, bicycle unscathed and leaning against a palm tree, I knew that that was the way I would hope to live forever, with abandon and without regrets. So this one, um, the title is part of the poem, so I'm just going to go right into it. At the grocery store of the intangible, I am never a window shopper, except in the Isle of Opportunities, where the top shelf is just out of reach, bottom shelf too low to stoop, and one at eye level always empty, stocked with the expired, or under lock and key. While I summon courage to ask for assistance retrieving happiness that sits behind glass by love and support, I wander to specials where I cave to temptation, filling my cart with charisma and wit. Before I head to checkout, I stop by fresh to load up on sleep and exercise, knowing they are but for optics, self-deception, and eventual rot. And in the queue, I watch as fellow shoppers pay with loose change, large bills, and credit cards supplementary or primary Figuring I could always return for happiness another day. Um, so um, I'm going to add an additional one that I didn't expect to read because uh, I think we have a bit of time for that. Um, so this one is called Doppelgangers. Do you think my doppelgangers are happy? Do you think that they to wake up each morning and look at themselves in the mirror with a mixture of contentment and resignation? Do you think any of them are leading the life they always wanted? The life I always wanted? Surely at least one is making dinner with herbs from the kitchen windowsill and heirloom tomatoes from the backyard, while a dilute tortilla winds its way around her ankles trying to trip her up, and your doppelganger watches with amusement from across the garlic is mincing. Do you think we haven't found each other because we all think we have a different good side, and so we all look different in photographs? What if we met in person? Would we recognize each other then? I think egos or the desire to preserve the self might get in the way and we'd all refuse to admit our similarities in appearance, but perhaps I'm just projecting. Do you think we'd get along, have anything in common other than our facial features? Jobs, hobbies, tastes in music and food? Maybe that's one who hates sushi and another one who finds folk rock excruciating. Do you think we'd be able to pull off a switcheroo or would those closer to, closest to us be able to tell? Would you be able to tell? Do you think they might sing or play instruments and if so, better or worse than me? Maybe we could form a septet or maybe a sextet plus a manager depending on dynamics. Do you think one of us is evil? What if we're all evil? Or maybe that's just one who isn't but we all think we're him. Do you think they ever wonder about each other and me? And if so, is it out of pure curiosity or because of a desire to switch lives? So that's my um, additional piece. Um, and then one more to close off my set is uh, soggy ham sandwiches. The dreams keep getting stranger and nobody knows why for sure. Personally, I think it could be anything from too much supper to the 24 hour news cycle. Anyway, in this one, delightful Dolly Parton is party guest of honor, kindly introduces corporealized Alexa, who offers me champagne and cobalt blue lobster, which would be the perfect meeting to no one's commentary on capitalism, 
a celebrity culture, only ends with me ditching the party to meet you by the beach for soggy ham sandwiches. So instead, it's just another crappy love poem. And that's it, that's it for me, uh, for this bit. <laughs> that's absolutely awesome. Fantastic. Thanks, Carrie. Oh, really I see, great. I see Melissa's uh, message about how she's got an inspired, similarly inspired story coming out in her chat soon. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> awesome. Very. I love that you had a poem that just came to mind that you interjected. Why did that happen? What What happened in you? What inspired you to put that that I, I, uh, that poem in? I don't really know. I mean, like it was the next page from one that I selected. And then I, I think I didn't choose it at first because it's a bit long and it's a little bit odd. Uh, but then, you know, like I think that this wraps me as well. I'm a little tall and I'm a little odd. So, you know, that, that really fit in really well. <laughs> well, it was great. It was fitting. Um, we're going to go into our, our uh, a word interview. So um, it's pretty casual. As you all know, if you've listened mm -hmm. to us before, we have some questions, but we're going to kind of have a chat. Um, first question is, what was the most surprising thing you learned about yourself while writing Reacquaint? Mm, um, I think, you know, it's definitely that I had a lot more stories to tell than I thought I did. Um, I've always quietly and sometimes not so quietly worried that maybe my life was a little too underwhelming for me to have anything worth writing about. Um, and, you know, like I've had my fair share of adventures and misadventures um, like everyone else. But, you know, there's always that shadow of doubt that maybe I hadn't lived enough. I hadn't lived wildly enough. Um, writing the poems that became reacquainted made me realize that, you know, sometimes it's not so much about the experience that it is about how you perceive the experience, how you make sense of it. Um, and then if you come at it from a different point of view, uh, you know, pretty much everyone has a story to tell. Yeah, and and I think in particular, I some of the like your bicycle poem, um, as someone who's terrified of riding a bike because at ten years old <laughs> I did something very similar where it was a disaster. There's a universality to what you're to what you're writing that I think everyone can connect on. It does not everybody climbs the Himalayas or does wild things, but everyone learns almost everyone to ride a bike, to learn to swim, to feel insecure to be in their own body and not feel quite connected. Um, so I think that that's what, why your poems kind of resonate um, for me anyway, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm sure everyone here uh, will agree on that, I think. Thanks so much, Kelly. <clears throat> and how did you make the decision on what poems to include in, in the chat book? Uh, so most of the poems were written in late 2021 and most of 2022. And that was a time when I was coming to terms with my diagnosis of, uh, diagnosis of a chronic illness and, you know, just adjusting to the kind of new way of living, new reality. So even if they didn't explore the exact subject matter of chronic illness of uh, an autoimmune disorder, uh, it was pretty similar in terms of the mood and the tone. So they were already in conversation with each other. There was a kinship that was built into these poems. So uh, that made it pretty easy for the initial round of selections. Then the second and final round of selections was guided by the concept. So um, I worked with an editor pretty early in the process to kind of fine tune the manuscript before it was submitted. And one of the suggestions that they made was for me to list out all of the poems and then try to identify similarities or, you know, whether they complemented each other. So um, what I did was to allow my project managers like to take over and then I just plug it all into a spreadsheet. I listed out the, um, you know, the title and then the form because I played with form a lot in this book. There was uh, quite a lot of prose poems. Then of course there was the typical three verse. And then I also messed around with um, the concrete poems. So like the shape poems. Um, so I listed out the form, I listed out the key themes in each of the poems, as well as the key imagery. And then uh, that was also one thing that I did to find a cover for the book. Um, and then based on that, four categories naturally emerged. So that turned into the four sections of the book, which is uh, reshape, reflect, reimagine, and release. And then that fed up into a larger concept of, you know, a speaker getting to know themselves again after a pivotal diagnosis. Um, and, and that's actually where the title comes from. So um, the idea of getting reacquainted with yourself. Uh, and then I chose it to be reacquainted because I, I have a habit of writing in the present tense. 
Um, so yeah, that's where it comes from. And I ended up letting go of a couple of poems, I think maybe three or four. So two were archived um, because I no longer felt like I identified with them. And then two more made it into my next book, which is coming out next year. Oh, okay. So there's more to come. That's good. That's good news. I was going to say, hey, um, now you were saying um, that you no longer related. So this is going off question, but you were no longer relating to those. Um, do you notice that when you sometimes read back on your writing that you'll look at it and go, who was that person? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think if anyone says that they don't outgrow what they've written, I, um, they might want to worry about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like uh, uh, I remember a writer friend that I had a couple of years ago, I was like saying that, is it normal to cringe a little when you look at your older older stuff? And she's like, yeah, it's normal. I cringe at stuff that I wrote a month ago. I'm like, that's fast. <laughs> but, you know, like I, I get where she's coming from. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it is. It, there, there are some poems that when I read them, I still have a lot of love for them but it doesn't feel like it's coming from the same place where I am now. And I think that's a good thing because, you know, people need to change, they need to grow and they need to move on. Do you have any favorite poems in this chat book? Um, why or why not? Like if you don't, why not? And if you do, what are they? Yeah. Um, so I, I know we're not supposed to have favorites because I, I read this quote where they said like, poems are like children, you're not supposed to have favorites, but um, you know, I, I do I, I do have uh, favorites. Um, I love all of them, which is why I've included them in the uh, manuscript that, you know, is now the book. Uh, but there are a few that I connect more with, even after all this time that I, I've uh, written them. So like uh, the at the grocery store, the intangible, that's one that really sticks with me. Doppelgangers, which is why I chose to read it as well. Uh, and then When We Die, which I'm going to read later on. So these are poems that were written, When We Die especially was written in 2020. The other poems were written in maybe like 2021, I think. And I still identify with them. So they're kind of like a favorite for that reason. There's also some poems that I just found them to be a lot of fun to read. So like the prose poems or like yarn that I read just now. Um, it's just a pork behind it, as I mentioned just now, uh, that I found uh it, it's just fun, you know, it's like it's like telling a story. And then I I, I love the cadence, I love the the rhythm to it, and that's why that's a favorite. Yeah, and I, I, I jokingly had said once, I think it was to my husband, that I didn't want people to read my poems or criticize them or edit them because it would be like editing my soul or my child. <laughs> so it, so in the editing process, like when you're making your selections, is it very hard for you to let things go? Uh, yeah, at first. So when I brought my, um, my book to the uh, editor that I worked with, um, I, I think that were like. 30 poems maybe 32 poems in there and then there was this this like you know I wrote all of this I want this in there it needs to be in there and I think I needed some remind reminding that not putting it in this book uh you know doesn't mean that it's never going to be seen like it's never going to see the light see the light of day um and and I think just being reminded that sometimes including something can be detrimental to the to the manuscript um I think I needed that kind of reminder so yeah, but it is hard to let go because it's like, a, that, that's my baby. I can't, I can't say no, you know, like I, how could I let it go? But yeah, it happens. Do you have any um, literary heroes or like main influences? Um, so it's a personal hang up, but I always feel kind of hesitant to call people my heroes or influence because I feel like it adds pressure um, on how I perceive them. It's it's like such a weirdly, you know, like thing that I fixate on, but um, I, I feel like it adds pressure on how I perceive the person as well as, um, you know, to justify how my work is similar to, to theirs, because if I call them my influence. But I will say that there are a few poets that I feel their work uh, is absolutely essential, not just in terms of like essential reading, but just essential to the world. Um, people like Amy Nejikumatato. So um, I've got the blurring on, so I'm just going to turn off my blurring for a second and you might be able to see it. This is one of her books. So Amy is a fantastic poet and she's amazing. Oh, I can see it. I'm sorry for the idea. Yeah. Uh, she, she's amazing, absolutely amazing. Like her poetry is so visceral. Um, and then I love Chen Chen's book as well. Uh, I had like a huge fanboy reaction because Chen Chen just followed me back on Twitter. Like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this here, but he followed me back <laughs> on Twitter. And then early on, he, he uh, published one of my poems in uh, Lickety Split, you know, the, the lit journal that he, he runs on Twitter. Um, so yeah, that's huge, you know, and, and uh, yeah. I mean, like, 
Like I, I love, I love his poetry. It's amazing. Um, and I went through some absurd lengths to get his chapbook into Singapore because uh, it, it's not easy. I think with small presses, you really want to support them, but sometimes it's challenging to get them to deliver to uh, locales outside of the US and the UK. Um, and then there is Richard Seiken as well. So I actually came to Richard's work uh, in a pretty interesting way. Um, I had someone very kindly say that my work reminded him of Richard, like Seiken's work. And I was like, I do wow. not dare to agree. Like I, would, I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't begin to, to, to say that, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. But I was really flattered. And then I started reading like uh, his stuff and he is wonderful. Um, and he's amazing on Twitter. Like he's, he, he's always like responding to people. So you constantly see someone going like, Mr. Saigon, what do you think of this? And then he just drops like amazing truth bombs and, and intelligent, like just wisdoms all the time. So yeah. Um, and then outside of poetry, uh, I have a lot of love and uh, respect for Hosea's uh, lyricism. So um, he's my favorite musician. Um, and, and I've been a fan since like 2015. So it's been like a decade or so, like almost a decade. Um, I just think that it's amazing how he's able to embed an entire world within just a couple of lines. Um, yeah, just something that I aspire to do uh, and, and hope that someday I'm able to. That's awesome. And, and could you describe for us a time in your life when you realized that language had power? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, <laughs> I didn't have the happiest childhood. And I think the happiest moments, like the best moments that I can remember from that time were mostly inside my own head, you know, like it's either courtesy of a good book or stories that I've made up while playing with my Barbie dolls or drawing pictures. Um, and I think that was the beginning of me realizing the power of language to kind of whisk you away from reality and take you into a world of your own creation or created by someone else. Um, as a child, I read a lot of Annie Blyton um, because that was just what was available to me. Uh, I'm very aware of the criticism around her work these days. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't read her books anymore. Um, but it is part of my personal history. And I grew up on her short story collections. Uh, so I also read like her naughtiest girl in the school. I, I identified a lot with that. Don't don't ask me why. Uh, I, I read her. Five oh, I'm going to ask you why. <laughs> I'm going to ask you why. <laughs> so, so yeah, I identified uh, a lot with that. Oh, Tiffany loves that as well. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I always look back to my childhood and then like most of it is like inside my head, like the fantasies that I've made up. And, and I think there's a lot of comfort in that, you know, um, and so some of that was like reading books like Not Years Girl in the School and imagining that, oh, maybe that could be me. Um, or like her, I think she wrote like the Five Fine Order series. So the the idea of a bunch of children having so much power, being able to put on disguises and investigate like all the all the crimes that was happening, I think, I think that was very appealing, like as a child, because you're like, that gives you a lot of power. Um and then as I got a little older, I started getting into Matt Cabot. So I started with Princess Diaries. And then I went into all of like her individual uh, young adult novels, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I think she's also like a really kind woman in general. Like uh, uh, she would actually respond to, to emails. I should have tried emailing her. Maybe I will after this. Um, but yeah, uh, Matt Cabot's work. And then uh, I also was a huge fan of Archie comics. Like um, not much literary... Uh, value some people might say but I think it was a really it's a really nice way to to just kind of relax after school and I still remember um it was pretty cheap at the time like five dollars six dollars for the thicker uh issues um and like three bucks for the thinner issues and I would you know after school and that I would just scrounge up whatever uh cash I still have um rush to the newsstand and purchase like the latest copy and I get so excited when it comes out um, and, and yeah, I, I had like thousands of issues and I'm always going to regret selling them because we ran out of space and I think I, I let them go. Um, yeah, I, st I still think of it sometimes, but yeah, all of these, I think was where I first saw the power of language, um, and also like writing, like inspiring me to create my own stories after reading all of these. So you were talking about going and, in 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 reading these things and imagining yourself in, in, in these different scenarios and the possibilities um, for me, I'm a different generation, obviously, and it was Judy Bloom in mm. those days for me. And we would, I, I watched a documentary about her recently where I realized that my literal parenting style was adopted from Judy Bloom books. It's crazy how it's, and it, I didn't even realize it until I watched it. 
So when you look back on those things and just like, wow, this really shaped me. And it was, it is powerful. It really does reach you when sometimes your parents don't reach you. Authority don't reach, you know, th- things where you might, for me anyway, my mm-hmm. parents always reached me, but there was definitely a safety in the words of, of writers um, where you could glean what you wanted and needed from that, uh, from that work without yeah. the judgment. <laughs> Absolutely. Parents, like yeah. uh, my, my mom was always someone that I could talk to. Um, she's actually in a call right now. I think she is. Uh, <laughs> okay, wait, I, I, I actually said so um, I, I could always talk to my mom uh, and and that was good but you know like kids are weird and and uh, like I'm saying that as a weird kid so there are just some things that you can't exactly see and and uh, you just got to deal with it inside of your own head so um, yeah that that's definitely the kind of safe space that the books created can you tell uh, me about your proudest writing moment I think that's yet to come. <laughs> I'm I'm really <laughs> early in my career, uh, writing career, and I'm something that I hope will spend like decades from here. Um, but yeah, you know that there's definitely been many moments of pride since I started submitting work in 2020. So I I started writing when I was maybe six years old. Uh, and then uh, but I really only started submitting work and accepting the judgment that comes with that. Uh, in 2020, right around the time the pandemic began. Um, so I had quit my job at that point and and I kind of told myself that, look, if you're going to be unemployed, take the chance to do what you want and actually write and get your work out there. So I started submitting work and, um, you know, when the first acceptance came through, it was huge because uh, when I was preparing to submit work, I read a lot of uh, stuff about how, you know, um, uh, people are going to take a long time to get back to you. People are going to say no. You might see no many, many times before you get an acceptance. Um, But I think it was like my second submission where I got the acceptance from Ian Chong, who runs uh, You Know Your Review. So that's a Singapore-based journal that's pretty international in its scope. And he's committed to responding within 24 hours. So I got a response within like a few hours. And he's like, yeah, I want to publish your work. And I think it didn't matter to him that I had never been published right up to that point. So that was a huge moment for me. And then, you know, there are the nominations, there are the uh, all the milestones associated with Rio Queens. Excuse me. And, you know, like the acceptance coming through from Kate Books, seeing the first draft, seeing it in book form, I was like freaking out when it finally showed up in my house. So yeah, that, that was huge. That all those all that are like huge moments that I felt all pride. But like I said, you know, I'm really early in my in my writing career. And I think the best is yet to come. I hope. <laughs> Well, it, it, along those same lines, what does literary success look like to you? I think that numbers will always have huge relevance. You know, like um, it's just a very tangible way of looking at things. If you look at the number of books, number of publications, sales, uh, nominations and awards. But I do try to get avoid trying to get uh, I do try to avoid getting caught up in all that because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's easy to just start comparing yourself and feeling like that about yourself. Like, oh, you know, like this person has been published 70 times versus my 30 times. And that makes me feel awkward about myself. Um, So instead, I try to focus on people and the impact of my work on them. For me, literary success is really just people reading my books, uh, reading my work, reading my poems um, and connecting with it. It's when, you know, people tell me, oh, that's so relatable. Like I, I've always thought that, but I hadn't been able to put it into words. Or, you know, like um, when they quote my lines back to me and, and that just makes me weak at the knees because they're like, oh, this line's really great. I'm like, oh God, you have no idea what that does to me. Um, and then I think that's success, you know, but all that said, I still hope people buy my books. <laughs> 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 just being really honest there. <laughs> I love it. Well, I really appreciate you talking with me in, in this such a candid manner. I so appreciate it. Um, And we will move on to our guest readers. Um, First of all, our first guest reader is Frances Klein, a poet and teacher, uh, writing at the intersection of disability and gender. Frances is the 2022 winner of the Robert Golden Poetry Prize and the author of the chapbooks New and Permanent, The Best Secret, and the forthcoming Text Messages from the Angel Gabriel. She'll be reading some of her work for us, and I'm going to drop uh, some links in the chat for everybody. Please take it away, Francis. Hey everybody, thank you for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be here and just celebrate and read with Allison. 
Um, I do apologize. I've got one of the daycare viruses going around so you can hear my um, pack a day <laughs> voice at the moment. Um, I'm going to read two poems for you today, and I'm going to start with a piece that comes from uh, my forthcoming chapbook, which is called Text Messages from the Angel Gabriel, uh, which will be out in May-ish of this year. Um, so this is uh, a poem called The Angel Gabriel Says It's Not a Booty Call If He Doesn't Have Genitals. Um, and this one, the title sequences into the poem, so I'm going to re reread that. The angel Gabriel says it's not a booty call if he doesn't have genitals, and he doesn't. He comes over at 3 a.m., pulls down his joggers, and shows me what he calls the light of pure goodness. The light seems mediocre at best, but I go along with it. The angel Gabriel wants intimacy in these smallest hours of the morning, so we compare embarrassing adolescent photos. Me with my self-cut baby bangs, him with his infinite number of eyes. He lays on my bed, head hanging over the edge, legs stretched up against the wall. We kiss once as sunrise checks its watch on the other side of the horizon, but the angel Gabriel doesn't know how. He pulls his lips all the way back, meets mine with his perfectly straight, dry teeth. We lay side by side and I fall asleep somewhere in the middle of the angel Gabriel telling me which US presidents are in hell, which is all of them. In the morning, the pillow still holds the indent of his head. Thank you. I'm gonna read, um, I'm gonna read one other poem. Um, this one comes from uh, my full length collection, Another Life, which is gonna be out kind of around this time next year. Um, and one of the one of the things that uh, kind of originally drew me to Allison's work is how much she writes about um, pain, which is something that she and I have unfortunately in common, um, not a club you wanna be in, but here we are. <laughs> um, so I am gonna read uh, my poem, Resume which is, uh, was originally inspired by a poem by the poet Michael Torres. Uh, so this is a resume. I put in two years at the jack-o'-lantern factory, awarded nose hole cutter of the month, 10 months running. I priced freight at a drugstore where cruise ship workers bought instant noodles by the pallet. I was head assistant to a reverse pest removal expert, working overtime, putting bats and raccoons back in attics, coaxing possums and skunks back under crawl spaces. For a long time, I've been angry. One summer, I was a living mandala, folding t-shirts all day on one side of a table while tourists unfolded them on the other. If beauty is impermanence, my table and I were the most beautiful couple the doc had ever seen. I was a museum docent for a culture not my own, telling stolen stories while the totems listened in. I was a photo model for an illustrated pain scale, making every face from one to 10, no acting required. I was an apprentice librarian new to Dewey's ways. Once I went on vacation, so my coworkers say, working from home for a seven pound boss on call as a living buffet all hours of the day and night. Then I was a professional bathroom poet hired by the coolest bars and coffee shops to cover low lit stalls in clean limericks for obscene prices. I have frequently been a complication, a wrench in the spokes. I was an AM DJ spinning theories into facts after midnight giving equal airtime to Sasquatch truthers and moon landing deniers. I keep applying for a position at the All Better Business Bureau, any opening, any department. Miraculously healed, finally over it. I even put in for an entry level spot in Road to Recovery. I leveraged every relationship, networked my ass off, called in every favor. All my resumes bounced back, the rejections kind but dismissive. You'll be a great candidate, they say, once you get some experience. 
Thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here. And congratulations again to Allison. I am so excited for this book. That was absolutely awesome. So great. That was really great. Thank you so much, Francis. I don't even have words, honestly. You said them all. You said all the words that need to be said. <laughs> it was awesome. Thank you. Um, our second guest reader is Letitia Jiju, a poet and an electronics and communications engineer who works in international trade. Letty is interested in the poetry of wave functions, quarks, and the little things. Her work appears um, or is forthcoming in Ninth Letter, Poet Lore, Passenger, Passengers, I'm sorry, Passages North, Anley, and elsewhere. Letty will read one of her most popular poems. Over to you, Letty, and I will drop some links in the chat to her work. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for the, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for being here, everyone. I'm a little shy when it comes, like, I'm not a shy person, but I'm just shy about reading my poetry for some reason. So I'm going to read one poem for you guys. It's called Non Affliction. And here it is. Um, the first tremor is unperceived. When I loved, I loved, quiet on the richer scale. When it came to it, I was unstinting in the same hard want that salted Lot's wife, voracious in my dissolving. Such abandon, even in the moat, is natural for the salt who disappears fully when wet. It is possible I ripped the isotrope, shook its meat perpendiculars. The Dead Sea is said to have tipped over that night like a hiccup. I was incredulous for you. And so there it is. Um, I am so happy for Alison. I've, it's so like nice to see everyone finally, because I just know you guys from Twitter and you know, it is so difficult to, I don't even see some of you and your tweets anymore. And it's just so difficult for a poem to really take off and get viral and like reach people these days on Twitter because you're just like swamped with, I don't even know <laughs> anything, but like there's so much nonsense going on there. But anyways, I'm so thrilled to meet everybody and, you know, listen to such incredible voices and great poetry and uh, happy reacquaintance day to everybody. Yeah, and, and Letty, that was really fit. wonderful. I know you were, you were, had trepidations about maybe doing it, but I'm so grateful to you for, for, for taking the leap. It's fantastic. Um, now we're just going to one moment. I will be right with you. Um, we are going to close off our launch Allison will read a few more poems from Real Quaint. Uh, thank you so much again for everyone for coming. I'm very excited about this. I think we all are. And the support is so lovely from the community. And we're still all here. Um, we're still, we're going to keep going. And I'm, I'm hoping uh, everyone goes out and grabs their copy. Uh, Allison, go ahead, take it away. Thanks so much, Kelly. And thank you, uh, Letty, as well as Francis, for, for reading. That was amazing. Thank you for being here. Um, and of course, thanks, Kelly, for, for, for hosting this. Um, so I'm going to read a poem called Road Trip. It's one of my favorites. There is an inimitable kind of invincible you are at 19, making promises you cannot keep to friends you will not keep. Because hubris is not deception, and it's not a lie if you believe it. And at 19, there is no reason to disbelieve the plans you make with Sarah and Ed over McDonald's hash browns to road trip across California right after graduation. Even though you paid with loose change in currency from a country 8,610 miles away. While Ed nods off in his seat from yet diagnosed narcolepsy, Sarah tells you how the best breakfast potatoes are always from diners attached to gas stations in the middle of nowhere. And you nod sagely as though you are in on the secret. For the rest of college, hash browns and gas stations alternate as shorthand for your brand plan, symbols of an unbreakable promise. But after 19 comes 20, and after 20, 21. And one day you are suddenly a 30-year-old liar, 
Sarah is a text message from six years ago you never responded to, and Ed is Edmund or maybe Edward again. And though you will meet other people, go other places, and have other adventures, every so often you will think about the time you never pulled up to the gas station diner combination at which Sarah had the best breakfast potatoes of her life, only to discover the entire place had long been abandoned for ruin, and the only lights you thought you saw incandesce from Sarah's memories and your imagination. This one is called Fragments, uh, is another prose poem. Back when we still spoke, we used to run off on these weekend adventures to spots across the city, We've never, we'd never visited prior and would never think to visit under typical circumstances. She went because she felt it made no sense to cover the rest of the world before you knew well your own fragment. I went because I needed a break from perpetually fantasizing about escaping said fragment altogether. On one of these adventures, we found a desert spot on the ground floor of a decrepit shop house where we shared deep fried crispy bean crit skin and black glutinous rice porridge. After, on the way to our next destination, we ran from persistent pursuers who turned out to have misunderstood our brisk pace as known how know how about the train schedule, and decided it was easier to follow silently than ask us. On another occasion, we explored the neighborhood in which I grew up and where she still lived, leaving after we exchanged pleasantries with a curious neighbor and bought cold canned drinks from the convenience store around the corner. At her family home, we sipped our ice cream sodas while flipping through her mother's high school yearbook before spending the rest of that day on the swings at the playground. Years on, I still think of these fragments of fragments, enough to want to write about them, but never enough to want to speak to her again. I still Google her, though. Like, I, I won't talk to her, but I will Google her to make sure that she's fine. Um, <laughs> so uh, I probably shouldn't admit that I, I still stalk old friends, but, you know, Anyways, um, so this one is called Pebble. Further to the last time we break each other's hearts, I go alone to the sea, picking my way through sunbathers at Kalini Beach until I find solitude beside a chain link fence. By the water, summer does little to shatter the bone chill of the sea breeze that seeks refuge in every gap between my skin and already see unseasonable trench. In lieu of the unsaid words I should have shaken out of my coat pockets last night, I shake sand out of my sneakers, pressing a bare foot against a glittering pebble I want but will not take. Overhead, a lone gull concurs. I'm um, sorry, I just need a drink of water. Be right back. And then I've got... One more. Um, it's the last poem in the. Sorry. Um, a a Allison uh, Kelly got uh, knocked out of the. Oh, the okay. group. Okay, if you I'm could gonna... let her back in. Yep. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so this poem is called "When We Die." I think it's one of the oldest ones in here. It was written in twenty twenty. Um during the start of the pandemic. And I think you can you might be able to tell from the from the mood. Um, so this poem has taken many different forms over the years and it has never found a home. And it, it every time I look at it, I think of I think a tweet that someone posted and they said that, you know, um, don't worry if a poem you love uh, hasn't found a home yet. You can always put it in your book, which is exactly exactly what I did. Um, and it's the last poem um for good reason. Like it it just I think it's a good way to end. So this is called When We Die, and it's a, um, it's a, you yeah, see it, it's a concrete poem that's a lot of like scattering across the page, uh, I really love it. Um, so, where do they go when we die? Those short hands we blaze into being. Words, acronyms, gestures, touches, meaningless blown off our searing call. He says they die with us, dissipate to naught. I think they lodge into that yawning chasm that is the night sky, become nebula awaiting that next great turbulence to live again. As diffuse non sequiturs, our conversations so weighty, they threaten to collapse in on themselves, that shared vernacular exists on. 
in old or new incarnations uncertain, but ever transcending us. And that's the end of the set. Thank you so much, Allison. I apologize for the tech difficulties. I think the internet was trying to tell me just to be quiet, keep it short. No, I'm kidding. No worries um, at all. Um, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And I want to thank again, Letty and Francis for coming. I want to thank the Rafanya Press, of course, uh, for letting me have this platform to, um, to, you know, try to get the voices of important writers um, out there. Great work, everyone. Thank you so much for giving of your time. We're from all over the world. It's pretty incredible. Um, and I, I just want to thank everybody for that. And we, we'll be, if you want, um, we can, if you have questions, you can send, drop an email, I'm sure, to either Allison or the Rafinha Press about links once this is all up and running, if you wanted to revisit it or, uh, or watch it uh, coming up soon. Um, and thank you so much. So much, uh, Allison, for your talents and for your time and for just sharing who you are with everyone through your work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. I am super honored to have you here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Hey, everyone.